And hello, everybody um, out there in Ollie land. Um, I'm Deirdre English, and uh, I have been asked to meet with you all today. I, I actually cannot see how many people are out there, but um, I think the screen is slowly populating with people. And um, I am going to plunge in. I've been asked today to talk about the Me Too movement and specifically about the role of journalism in the rise of the Me Too movement. I'll show that the Me Too movement is built on decades of feminist theory, law, and legislation. Yet it needed a fresh dose of radical investigative journalism to get fired up. And I'm gonna look back at the history of women's rights and speculate about when the movement moves and why it stalls, where we are now and where we are headed. But before plunging into all that seriousness, I want to take a few minutes to just first acknowledge that we're all going through a very tough passage with a pandemic threatening and isolating us all. It can be hard to think about anything else and it can be dispiriting. So let me begin with a digression, a very brief one about our current circumstances, yet one that will not again mention the dreaded virus. Instead, Let's just take a second to notice that spring has quietly arrived too. On March 20th, the vernal equinox passed and the hours of daylight have been increasing since then. And so the spring festivals are here. Let me review. Passover begins tonight at sundown. Even if Jewish families cannot join together and welcome one or more strangers into their midst as is the tradition, Soon to follow is Christian Easter on April 12th, even if worshipers will not, I hope, be packing the pews. Persian Nowruz, which starts the new year with the spring, which makes a lot of sense, was on March 19th. In the Greek myths, Persephone spent the winter in Hades, which symbolizes death, and emerged with the spring flowers, which symbolize rebirth. Islamic Ramadan starts on April 23rd this year with the stark dichotomy of fasting and feasting, life and death, death and life. The people of many religions, as well as nature worshiping pagans and also people of no religion, know that we need holidays at this time to help us through the last vestiges of gloomy winter and to welcome the spring with summer just around the corner. In India, Holi, the Hindu spring festival of colors, celebrates the triumph of good over evil, and fittingly, people burn bonfires to scorch lingering germs. In Japan, the cherry blossom festivals beckon everyone outdoors. And in Berkeley, this is a gorgeous month, with blossoming fruit trees all about us and flowering vines, wisteria, trumpet vine, bougainvillea. So this is a beautiful time to walk in the neighborhoods while physically distancing and perhaps practice flower naming, the treasure trove of poets. So take heart because a change in the weather and in the scourge that afflicts us is coming and spring is here. It really is. And now back to being on Zoom to talk about the Me Too movement. Today's topic cannot compete with a walk in the sun Still, I hope we can enjoy this hour of conversation about something other than disease, darkness, and death. Actually, my talk today is also optimistic. It's about another kind of turning point that we are in the midst of, the Me Too movement, and how it is evolving and maturing, not retreating or failing. Indeed, the Me Too movement is a harbinger of better times to come for all of us. Just this last week, I finished my required biannual training um, the, as a university employee on how to avoid discrimination and harassment. How many of you have taken such an online course? They are now required in most workplaces. It may seem boring and obvious already to many, but it is still fairly new. I worked and taught for decades, including in this university and others, without any such requirement to know the laws that pertain to me as a professor to help us avoid committing or passively witnessing or abetting these infractions. And yet sexual harassment and discrimination was frequent in life. It happened to me in my younger days several times, though not in any physically hurtful way. 
it did happen in ways that were at least temporarily derailing of my career, my freedom, and my confidence, but I wrote those incidents off. Similar things happened to colleagues, but they did not often share about it. Why not, I ask now, looking back. Well, we thought it was just the way things were, and there was nothing to be done about it. Extreme violence, rape, and domestic battery were feminist causes from the 70s on, with the second wave, my wave, but anything less was a bridge too far for the most part. These anti-discrimination courses that we must take get progressively better each year, I have noticed, and they're reinforced from the top by Chancellor Carol Christ, who has evinced a strong commitment to protecting the community, community from discrimination based on sex, race, age, gender identity, or sexual preference. Some, but not all of these rights are established federally and we have more protections than most states do here in California. The very fact that we have a woman chancellor is a sign of the progress of what's been called the longest revolution, the women's rights revolution. It has been argued that having a woman at the top makes a big difference here, and I believe it. Human rights departments answer to upper management, which sets the tone, take it seriously or trivialize it and wish it away. Watching these rights spread and get entrenched in institutions, law, and legislation convinces me that the hashtag MeToo movement is no fad, nor media creation, nor snowflake, too woke, overreaction, though it emerged suddenly and took everyone by surprise with gale force winds rattling all of our windows. It has deep and strong roots, and it is here to stay. To see it in historical context is to see that Me Too even in its viral, Twitter-born manifestations, is by its nature a part of a fundamental human rights movement, one whose roots go back to the Civil War, then the civil rights movements for the vote for African Americans, then suffrage for women, then the civil rights movement that put an end to de jure segregation. Rights upon rights upon rights, never ending. With all of its faults, the thing that justifies our constitutional democracy most is its expansiveness, the way in which fundamental equality rights slowly open to include more people. Power concedes nothing without a demand, in the words of the great anti-slavery activist Frederick Douglass. It never did and it never will. Find out just what any people will quietly submit to and you have found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. Women have been waking up to notice what they were quietly submitting to and that it will continue to be imposed on them unless they get up and do something about it. But for power to relent, it first takes uncovering and reporting on injustice. The rise of social movements, of protests, the influence of public opinion, and then legislation and lawsuits, appeals, and precedent-making court decisions. None of it can be skipped. This year, 2020, marks the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, guaranteeing and protecting women's constitutional right to vote. That's not so long ago. At that time, my mother was five years old. Her mother, my grandmother, who I remember well, did not even get to choose her own husband and was married before she had the right to vote. But in 1920, the seeds of change were planted, even if for decades most women had inferior educations and asked their husbands who to vote for. The next big burst of the women's rights revolution lay in education. When I was a college student, there were still many exclusively women's and men's schools. And in fact, in 1970, I was in the first wave of coeducation, enrolling in a men's college at a time when women were less than 2% of my class. Was I sexually harassed by a professor who suggested a quid pro quo relationship with me involving sex for an A? Yes, I was, and I refused, and he retaliated, and I had no one to turn to to complain. So I shrugged it off. The good news was that the women's liberation movement was making trouble, and I was part of that. I taught in a brand new women's studies department at SUNY Old Westbury and at Queens College in New York. I published with something called the Feminist Press, which still exists, and I joined a consciousness raising group in Greenwich Village that a writer named the Fourth Street Circle in a novel of the times. And none of that stopped me from having boyfriends and fun times too. 
In my era, law school and medical schools were being breached by women, and as women surged into the workforce at all levels, they also began to take their places in the professions. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is the classic Exhibit A. Graduating at the top of her law school class, she was refused a position in a top law firm, but she became a, a pioneer of gender justice and finally a Supreme Court, and finally took her place on the Supreme Court. I moved to San Francisco and became a writer and editor, and after a while, the top editor of Mother Jones Magazine, a movement magazine that features investigative reporting and feminist thinking to this day. I was the only woman editor of a national political magazine that was not explicitly a women's magazine at that time. And in my first year as editor, 1980, to my great disappointment, Ronald Reagan became president. Soon there came a period that the great feminist writer Susan Faludi aptly identified as a time of backlash. And it was a long period during which protest waned, progress stalled, and a pre-existing class split between the emerging career women of the professional classes and the women of the classes that had always worked, that schism grew into a great gulf as inequality yawned ever larger over 40 years from that time to today. As it invisibly eroded, we lost the American dream of shared upward mobility for all, of working class and middle class solidarity, and somehow the super rich bamboozled us and recreated a new gilded age that has yet to be well named. Today, the top 1% control nearly twice as much as the bottom 90%. Yet while this downfall was happening, somehow many young women in the 80s, 90s, and 2010s did not want to openly join the movement and call themselves feminists. Even as they surged through the newly opened doors into higher education, and better jobs than their mothers had ever had. Perhaps students felt that things were good enough because women did incredibly well in college and professional schools, often surpassing men. Title IX opened up women's sports and women excelled and prided themselves on new levels of strength, fitness, and competitiveness. The feeling seemed to be that the young tacitly thanked the older generation for opening the doors but now wanted to prove themselves individually worthy of competing with men and with each other. Thank you very much. It was a very individualistic and acquisitive era, which has been much discussed. Yet things were not really going that well for women collectively. As the inequality I described grew, women, no matter how educated, were fighting declining prospects, unless they were in the top 10% of wealth and income. Everyone lower, no matter how energized and hardworking, was in effect trying to climb up a down escalator, sometimes just coming even with men who were riding the down escalator. Actually, and so poignantly sadly, women's entrance into the workforce did not really increase family prosperity, except at the top, but rather helped mask the relative decline of the working class wage, the middle class salary. And as women in the professions kept hitting the glass ceiling and working class women made little progress in their wages, while the male wage, formerly known as the breadwinner wage, eroded, other rights like abortion rights were chipped away, while the costs of education, healthcare, and housing kept spiking up, as Elizabeth Warren so ably documented. Then 9-11 happened in 2001 and we entered a new era an era of war in the Middle East and the vast costs of war that drained society. The ambitious young people who came of age before the Great Recession of 2008 were already at the limit of their powers to make the lives they expected. And then with the housing meltdown, many felt increasingly economically trapped. But even as, the main, as mainstream feminism seemed to die down for such a long stretch, activists never rested. Kimberly Crenshaw introduced the concept of intersectionality into legal argumentation in the early 90s, showing how racial and gender discrimination can and do coexist. Gay marriage was established. In feminism, uh, including at this university, deep research was done, scorching books were written, if not so much read, and shocking documentaries were made. 
One that had a huge effect on campuses was the hunting ground about rape on campus. A nightmare of college-based sexual abuse began to be revealed. Young women began to speak of living in a rape culture. Older feminists asked what happened to have stalled and reversed social progress so much. The joys of liberation seem to have been lost to the perils of libertinism. Young people seem to have been strangely abandoned to invent their own rules without guidance. Misery often ensued. The relations between the sexes seemed so troubled. Marriage rates stalled, pickup and hookup norms became a thing, and online pornography became and remains sex education for too many kids, especially men, in the observation of our local chronicler of the sex mores of the young, Peggy Orenstein. We are talking about the basic elements of human happiness here. Feminist historians have noted that the pattern of women's progress seems to be two steps forward, one step back. But inching ahead in that fashion, we still make progress. The new civil rights laws of the 60s and 70s were chugging away in the background. They protected women in the workplace and were at first focused more on discrimination due to stereotyping, for example, than on harassment. Case law shows us a young woman who was fired from her front desk job at a hotel for lack of prettiness and the Midwestern girl look, but a court decided that that was evidence of wrongful st sex stereotyping and thus sex discrimination. And so women were, began to have more legal protections for how they looked and how they behaved. Older women, won the right to be evaluated based on their abilities and not based on their age. A wonderful film called North Country recounts the first class action lawsuit that women won that showed how women were harassed often not to win sexual favors, but to intimidate them into leaving their jobs. So for those decades, women were fighting often in the courts simply to have the right to work. Now we come to the current generation. This next generation is different. They grew up seeing working women in every field, almost every family, and they knew the economy was a thing of peril with the destitute in the streets, debt on the rise, and family finances often at a breaking point. Think of it. If you're about 20 now and maybe a junior at Berkeley, a post-war prosperity belonged to your grandparents. On 9-11-2001, you were one year old when the planes hit the buildings and the so-called war on terror was launched by George Bush. And so you don't remember that, of course not. You were say seven or eight when Obama was elected. And over the next eight years, you came of age, perhaps believing in a progressive idealism about race and gender and hope. Maybe you noticed how Obama was stymied by the Tea Party and an oligarchic Republican Senate or maybe you just blamed Obama for being too mild-mannered and not accomplishing enough. Police shootings of black males were spiking unconscionably. School shootings were real. Global climate crisis roared above everything as an overwhelming existential challenge. Then maybe you were 15 or 16 in 2016 when suddenly Trump's election almost four years ago shocked your system to the core. After the youthful and hip Obama, we have the very archetype of an old white male back in charge. And so we suddenly have a generation again of young people who are not having it, who are as outraged and impatient and demanding of social change and, many, and maybe socialist change if they can get it, as those of us who remember ourselves in the 60s. And with it, the next big wave of the women's movement has arrived. A young woman asked me if we still number the waves. <laughs> uh, is this the third wave, the fourth wave, or whatever? I don't know. But I hope that each wave is bigger, builds our confidence, and makes more room for more rights for the next wave. This new generation of woke students have been leaders in reviving feminism, as they have also led the charge on race and class awareness, and fighting the biggest threat of all, climate change. At the Graduate School of Journalism where I teach, 
They are so different from any previous classes that I ever uh, met with in 20 years. They want relevant education, not too much history, so maybe they wouldn't like this talk. They're impatient to burn down the old and bring in the new. They're smart and fresh and delightful and remind me of the 60s and the women's movement of the 70s. How did this come about? It seems to have had everything to do with the election of Donald Trump, abuser in chief. Ironically, the defeat of Hillary Clinton had as much to do with it. Despite the years that had passed, her tenure in the Obama administration and her quest for recognition as her own person in the public mind, uh, yet Hillary still carried all the baggage of Bill's predation on women. During the Clinton impeachment saga, which young people don't remember, um, law, in law professor Catherine McKinnon's telling in an article in The Atlantic, quote, sexual harassment as an issue had become identified for many with the right, mor right wing morality crusade rather than with the coercion of inequality. During Hillary's presidential campaign, the whole feminist and liberal establishment that had defended Bill Clinton against impeachment was still stuck with not mentioning unwanted sexual attention and pressure, especially with regard to power differentials like that between Clinton and Monica Lewinsky. With Hillary, and therefore at last Bill out of the way, the pent up rage over ignoring and excusing sexual abuse and violence would no longer need to be constrained for reasons of liberal political expediency. And unlike the sheepish and repentant Bill Clinton, we now have as president a man who bragged of his entitlement even after some 22 women accused him of sexual abuses. We all remember the massive women's marches of January 2017, when between three and five million people, mainly women, came out into the streets in outrage. I'm not one who loved the symbolism of the pink pussy hats, nor did I wear one, but it did send a message. Now, since I have mentioned Catherine McKinnon, let's take a moment to respect her major foundational contribution to the cause of Me Too. It is she who pioneered the laws that define sexual harassment as a type of prohibited discrimination under the Civil Rights Act and its amendments, Title VII and Title IX. That established it as a human rights violation. But as she has said, just because something is illegal does not mean it stops. She uses the term systemic drag to refer to the lag between the law and um, and uh, the willingness and support victims must have to pursue their new legal rights. That is where journalism comes in, to partner with law by investigating and exposing corrupt and illegal activities and bring them into the light. To do that, journalists need on the record sources, just as legal cases need plaintiffs. The first people to fight for their rights under new legal definitions are always required to be very brave. When we look at the reporting that fueled the Me Too movement, we quickly recognize the Pulitzer Prize winning work done by Megan Toohey and Jody Cantor for the New York Times under the editorship of Dean Baquet, which eventually was described in the book, She Said. The New York Times did not by any means restrict its Me Too coverage to Harvey Weinstein, but also reported on widespread sexual abuse in multiple businesses and at the top of many journalism hierarchies. Charlie Rose and Les Moonvy and other powerhouses went down. The powerful testimonies of Gretchen Carlson and Megyn Kelly demonstrated the abuse at Fox News at the hands of Roger Ailes and Bill O'Reilly. In Carlson's words, in a TED talk, sexual harassment is not political. The harasser does not care if you are a Democrat or a Republican. In this polarized, hyper-partisan world that we live in, here is a cause that almost uniquely stands to unite women across the political spectrum, even if they agree from their separate silos. There are few things that can be said of all or even most women, but a desire to be free of physical and sexual coercion is one. 
nor do men want sexual coercion in the workplace for the most part. They do not want to be victims themselves, which does occur. But also, the majority of men are reasonably nice guys, at least in my experience, and would never do these things. The real threats tend to be serial abusers, which is one reason it is so important to drum them out. And often sexual abuse is connected to other forms of dominance and bullying directed at men, as well as women, who are lower in the hierarchy. Owners and boards of businesses and nonprofits, like universities, charities, and churches, also don't want to put up with it, because ever since it became an actionable human rights violation, it became very expensive. Typically, as we learned from the Me Too reporting, companies had required new employees to sign arbitration agreements, which in turn led to gigantic pay payouts, along with non-disclosure agreements. Women and some men and some families of minors had little choice but to settle for silence in exchange for a financial settlement. The payouts became unsustainable. The once powerful Weinstein company went bankrupt after paying many millions in payouts and legal fees. What a waste of Hollywood money that should have been spent making wonderful movies with women directors for a change. Or look at the Catholic Church. The Boston Globe, led by Marty Baron, focused an investigative reporting team that exposed widespread abuse of children in the Boston Archdiocese. Don't miss one of the best films about contemporary journalism called Spotlight. As the scandal got ever more attention, including in the Bay Area, the costs to the church have been enormous. Why did victims sign non-disclosure agreements? Their lawyers told them they had little choice, little choice of prevailing in court cases and that their names would be dragged through the mud if they pressed charges against the powerful, rich, and well-connected. The idea of revealing their violations seemed so shameful to so many. And so they took some money and the lawyers helped themselves to big cuts of it as well and, and well-padded business insurance policies paid the claims while the victims left their employers and their careers in silence and sometimes in shambles. But one of the great results of the Me Too reporting, especially that of Jody Cantor and Megan Toohey, has been to surface that as a system, one could almost call it a racket, that protected abusers and, uh, and allowed them to repeat their offenses with impunity. What the women who cooperated with the New York Times and with Ronan Farrow at the New Yorker did was to do what had been unthinkable, to break their non-disclosure agreements, risking lawsuits against themselves, which have not materialized, by the way, and going public with their names, faces, and stories. The reporting that Ronan Farrow did in particular in the New Yorker revealed how stubborn mainstream journalism had been in turning a blind eye to abuse by the powerful, often because the male-dominated upper echelons of the media were all too often sheltering abusers themselves, as his book shows, and were, so to speak, in bed with other abusers who they relied on for access to power. If you have not read Ronan Farrow's nonfiction thriller, Catch and Kill, I recommend it. It's a mind-boggling tale of the lengths that Weinstein went to, to lie and to spy when he thought Pharaoh and his female accusers were on his trail. I could have written a captivating speech today just by regaling you with Pharaoh's book chapter by chapter, but he does that himself in his podcast, which I also recommend. So, so far I have tried to show that the Me Too movement has deep roots in generational and political history and should be framed in a larger economic context as well. Note that in the uh, imperiled, um, I just lost my place, in the imperiled fortunes of the middle and working classes, women's career success is more important to them than ever today. They have no choice about that. So where are we now? The Me Too movement, I hope I have convinced you, 
will not and should not subside or succumb to backlash. That is, barring a total social collapse into authoritarian dystopia, always a threat to consider and vigilantly oppose, especially at a time of crisis. But if we continue as a constitutional democracy, as I fully expect, then Me Too will settle down in the sense that it will not be news all the time. It may morph away from its current slogans, hashtag Me Too and Believe Women. Certainly, we will hear of more troubling tales of wrongful sexual harassment charges. This follows from the old axiom in journalism that dog bites man is not a story, but man bites dog is a story. False charges make great clickbait. There are people who will abuse the heightened awareness um, and target the innocent. A horrific, although fascinating story of that sort was in the New York Times Magazine just recently about someone who was competing for an academic job who cooked up despicable sexual lies about a lesbian couple in order to derail their careers. Fortunately, he failed and his duplicity was exposed. Yes, women and men will make up fake rape stories. That has already happened. Um, at the J School, we use one that was published in Rolling Stone about a made up story at the University of Virginia as a teaching example of what not to do as journalists. The story had some glaring gaps in fact checking and eventually the episode reinforced the critical importance of multiple sourcing, interviewing witnesses and talking to all sides and their embarrassment taught Rolling Stone a valuable lesson, I would hope. Journalists have a special responsibility in that regard. We should not allow ourselves to be easily fooled. Um, here's a summary of an instructive story that I recently read and read about and remembered having read when it occurred. The Washington Post reported that a woman named Jamie Phillips approached the paper with a story about Roy Moore. She claimed that in 1992, when she was 15, he impregnated her and that he drove her to Mississippi to have an abortion, but it was all made up. It appears um, that Ms. Phillips was collaborating with Project Veritas, an organization that tries to expose mainstream media um, uh, purported bias through undercover sting operations. In fact, the group's intent and the woman's intent was to embarrass the Post and ultimately to discredit Mr. Moore's other accusers, making it seem as though they were also fake news. But the mission failed thanks to the scrupulous professionalism of the Washington Post, um, which fact-checked it every step of the way. So there's a, a good, another instructive tale of how um, bad actors can try to exploit this Me Too movement. And what about that phrase, believe women? It simply never was meant to say that no woman ever lies or abuses her power. After all, women are human. Rebecca Traster, the wonderful feminist writer, put it succinctly in a tweet. Me Too is not about some social injunction that we believe all women. It's about women telling their own stories. In the most prominent current cases, those stories have then been reported, investigated, fact-checked, and backed up by the outlets reporting on them. She is right. I interviewed Jody Cantor when she was our commencement speaker at the, the uh, Graduate School of Journalism for the J School podcast that I host. Our conversation was all about the demands of reporting, the mantra for which might be the old nuclear age adage, trust but verify. Cantor spoke of the long months of chasing paper trails, reading non-disclosure agreements, getting multiple sources both on the record and off the record, showing Weinstein their reporting before publication and giving him time to respond and quoting him, and even also trapping Weinstein in his own words. There is a world of difference between a single unproven allegation and a deeply researched investigation with multiple accusers, which may in turn lead 
as it has in Weinstein's case, to a trial over both the facts and the law. And that may lead, as it has, to a more nuanced interpretation of abuse versus consent that could have been predicted. The research, that research and reporting is what investigative reporting entails. It is not rumor mongering on social media without consequences. It's the real deal and it takes dogged hard work. And that's why Cantor and Tui won the Pulitzer Prize, the highest award in journalism, along with Ronan Farrow. They also changed the way that people think about the proper topics for coverage by the previously male dominated profession of investigative reporting. As a result of their work, non-disclosure agreements have come under fire in many states and companies have released women from abiding by ones they signed. And in California, new legislation now prohibits requiring them. Indeed, California has led the way in new legislation that um, addresses the issues that have been surfaced by the Me Too movement. That is making a difference. I want to mention another Pulitzer Prize winner. That's uh, our local Bernice Young for All in a Day's Work, her book about sexual harassment, violence, and rape directed against working class women. Her reporting also inspired two amazing frontline documentaries that I also recommend. Rape in the Fields, about abuse of farm workers, and Rape on the Night Shift, which is about rape of janitorial staff by their supervisors. Both films led to activism and organizing and real change. That is making a difference. As a society, we're learning about sexual harassment, violence, pressure, unwanted attention, and that these are not about sex, which is a beautiful thing when it is affirmatively consensual. No, sex abuse is embedded in a power relationship. We have a lot of consciousness raising still to do. I wish that I still had the Fourth Street Circle to meet with again now. We would spill the beans about all the old leches and handsy bosses we have had in long careers, and we would definitely have some funny revenge stories to enjoy. And we would be head over heels with relief, joy, and support for the new young feminists and all they have taught us while continuing something that we helped start too. And together we would look around and look within. We would think about intersectionality, about how racial, class, and gender biases interweave and reinforce. So many dated concepts are embedded not only in our law, but in our language, along with our racial and gender history of hierarchy and domination. Catherine McKinnon reports that in her observation, journalists still tend to write that a woman claims or alleges abuse, while a man will often be quoted as saying that he asserts it did not happen or denies what was alleged. She asks, what if we used the same word, perhaps claim, for both antagonists? Or take the word fair. I looked it up recently after a session watching Robert Reich's YouTube channel, which you should all subscribe to now more than ever, because I was wondering how to define a fair economy for all. We use the word to mean equal and honorable. So fair deal, a fair trade, a fair economy. It connotes beautiful, is in fair weather or a fair day, a beautiful day. Then again, the vision of beauty equates to women, the fair sex. And that idea contains the image of light skin, of whiteness, as in a fair complexion. Beauty is thus racialized. And as we think of the lovely light-haired woman with perhaps all her privilege, let us also recall that she was often referred to thus as fair game. So let us think twice as journalists and as consumers of journalism. Let's be skeptical of power players and structures and of the way things have always been skeptical also of good stories until they are verified and fact-checked, and even skeptical of the inheritance of language and our own assumptions and bias. 
A rigorous and uncorruptible skepticism about power abuse is the mission of journalism. The search for truth is the heart of journalism, as it is of the university. With that mission and that heart, positive change is possible. So to show the extent of that change around the world and how it is sparking, let me end with my one visual display, which I hope that Max will be able to help me put up on the screen before we go to a question and answer session. So this is, and in case it doesn't display well, you can also Google it yourself later. Uh, just, it's a Google Earth compilation of Me Too searches by date across the whole world. Here it is. Watch it and ask yourself if it might not be changing the world. Max, can you take over? Okay, well, we just saw what Deirdre was speaking of, and now we're ready to open for questions in the chat room. Susan, would you like to say something? Hi, uh, Deirdre, I wanna thank you very much. What an amazing, uh, sweeping history, historical view with all of the various elements of both knowing, uh, you know, that we, this is 45, 50 year history that you've just captured in 40 minutes. Um, I have two questions which are in part, um, first is to ask you, um, it has been a profound change to go um, to Chancellor Christ and the things that she's implemented around uh, sexual harassment. Um, do you think, it's two parts. Do you think Berkeley is doing enough? And is there other things that you think might be um, on the horizon that would be good? The other question not related to the first is um, some, uh, some feminists um, I've heard are making a distinction uh, between uh, Harvey Weinstein and Aziz Asari and saying there's a difference between someone who is innocently a sexual harasser and a predator that um, Weinstein obviously um, is the symbol of. Um, so either of those two questions to begin with. Thank you. Um, well, yeah, I mean, first of all, I would say that of course the university is still not doing enough and um, this is a, big issue right now that everyone is talking about is, is whether the human relations departments are sufficiently empowered. But I do see a lot of progress and change, and I think we're still working this out. We're in the middle of it. So I, I think it will, it will continue to improve if there continues to be pressure from below. Uh, change always comes from the grassroots, and it's students who have driven the change. And definitely at the Graduate School of Journalism, I see it's students 
who have um, driven, who have asked us to teach more about these issues, for example. We weren't teaching about them. So uh, uh, a lot, you know, really depends on this. Um, uh, I, I, change always just depends on the, on the youth. So uh, that's why I'm so excited about the current crop. Um, and then let me just say about um, Asti Sansari versus Harvey Weinstein. I, Weinstein, I don't think the, the, the uh, contrast between them is really about innocence or not, but about workplace harassment versus harassment on a, on a, on a date. And um, there's, you know, the, the, the movement, you know, has sort of spread its tentacles into every aspect of life. And I don't think that's a bad thing, but some things are actionable and some things are, are not. So um, there's, in that sense, you know, there's a big difference between what can be taken to court and what, and what cannot be, and, and behavior on a date is, is not so actionable. So um, uh, under the circumstances as they were described. So I think that's, we do need to be, I think, aware of the difference between employment situations and private situations. Let's see, I, by the way, I think people are being invited to put their questions on uh, the chat box. I should have said that earlier. Um, so I'll, I'll take a look at some of these questions. I, can every, I hope everybody can see them. Um, one person is asking, um, you know, whether, whether men will be fearful of mentoring women because of Me Too. Um, well, you know, um, I think that that's where education is so important and that when men are become very, you know, clear about what constitutes harassment and what doesn't, and many of them really were not for so many years. Um, so many men did things that were essentially violations without thinking of them as, as that. Um, that it's a, learning, it's a learning experience. And I also think it's really good for women to mentor each other. Um, and uh, that the more there are women in power, the more they can take, take on the role of being the, uh, the, the mentor and that helps. Um, somebody else wrote, um, let's see. Oh yeah, yeah. This is a quote, I've seen this before. Emily Linden, a Teen Vogue columnist tweeted, here's an unpopular opinion. I'm actually not at all concerned about innocent men losing their jobs over false sexual assault harassment allegations. Um, how do journalists and schools of journalism think about this perspective? Oh, well, I think it's outrageous. I mean, I think you're innocent until proven guilty and I, that she should not have said that. <laughs> um, that's her opinion, but it's a poor opinion to hold. Um, it is not right for an innocent person to lose their job over false sexual assault allegations. That seems obvious. Okay. Um, somebody writes that the news needs to be new, but it's still, sexual harassment is not new. It's still going on the same as always. And some people are bored with Me Too. So how do we keep it fresh? Well, you know, um, doesn't seem that new, that old to me. Um, and uh, I maybe that Google Earth uh, visual is a is a is a is a good answer. You know, you look, go there and go around the world and look at the way that people are searching for this all over the world. Um, people are looking for. In many ways, we're very blessed in this country. We have legislation that many other countries still don't have, and um, so. We're, we're still seeing a world in which feminist, feminists are, are emerging from law schools, feminist law is changing. I mean, California's law has just changed a lot just in the past two years. So I, I, don't, think it's, I don't think it's old yet. Are there any more questions? I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat box. So um, I'll turn it back to you, Susan. Uh, thank you so very, very much. This has been um, really insightful to me. Um, I became a feminist in 19, 
must have been 1975 when I interviewed Gloria Steinem for my student newspaper. And um, I remember the work that you did with Barbara Ehrenreich, uh, with witches, midwives, and nurses. And you have always been such a seminal thinker. Um, and, you know, I think choosing today's talk to really take a look at uh, journalists and how they're approaching uh, the Me Too movement is really helpful to me uh, to sort of understand the kinds of stories that are emerging um, and the, the ways in which Catherine McKinnon has been able to um, use the law to establish it as a human rights issue. Um, and for journalists to, to see not only in bringing the other stories forward, but also to look at where there is corruption and um, things that are illegal. Um, I think for many of us, um, for whatever we see ahead, whether it's the next wave, um, are really you know, concerned about how it can go beyond um, the sexual harassment and go beyond increasing uh, women's right to work. Um, you know, as, as we know, there are, um, in the corporate world, there is uh, very little um, advancement in that regard. My own work as a film director, uh, when I was trained to be a film director, 3% of the people directed uh, television and movies um, in Los Angeles, um, you know, has changed maybe a little bit. <laughs> but not nearly enough. So we've got big gains to make. And so if you wanted to give us an inspiring closure, <laughs> where do we take this? Um, how is this giving us a foothold, but also knowing that there's a whole big world out there <laughs> that needs to kind of move on its axis? Well, I don't know, every, every cloud perhaps does have a silver lining and um, maybe the election of, uh, of Trump has been such a giant wake up call uh, uh, on these issues that complacency is just not an option anymore. So uh, I think that we're, we're really kind of forced to ask ourselves whether, you know, what we're gonna do about the sort of Jurassic Park of uh, of uh, old male predators, the, the Donald Trumps and the Harvey Weinsteins, and um, that the alliance between all generations would be a really, a really great thing. I mean, we're often too divided by generation. And uh, I also think, you know, that there was something hopeful that I tried to mention about the fact that this is, is an issue that um, right-wing and left-wing women, Democrats and Republicans, can agree on, even as they hurl insults at each other. But women don't want to be harassed, no matter what their politics are. And, and um, most men are not harassers, so most men are allies. So the, the, the basis is there, completely there, for transformative change. Um, I feel very hopeful. That's why I started with talking about spring. Spring is here. I think. I think. Uh, I think we can be. I think we can be hopeful even in these dark times. Let me see who else wrote in here something. Um, yeah, somebody's bringing up this uh, question of the role of proportionality. By the way, can other people see the chat box or only me? People can see it. Okay. So the role of proportionality in addressing allegations of sexual harassment, what's the difference between touching someone on the shoulder, as Biden has been accused of, be treated differently from firing someone for refusing to participate in a sexual relationship? The law can be, have a very sharp and carefully defined scalpels. I mean, these things are not treated as the same. Um, the question might be, you know, whether you know, what, you know, what standing any particular complaint has, and there are some that would seem to have less standing than others. Um, but, uh, you know, we've, we, the Harvey Weinstein trial, I think was quite interesting. Many, many people, many feminists and, and uh, liberal activists who were looking at that trial did not think that the jury was gonna convict because of the fact that the 
two two women whose claims were were heard had engaged in consensual sex with Harvey Weinstein. And in previous years, this would have ruled, would have made it impossible to bring their case forward. Um, but the jury had did listen to the the um, the pro prosecution when they argued that just because someone has had consensual sex with someone or even has consensual sex after an abuse does not mean that an abuse didn't take place when there was non-consensual sex. And, you know, that means that the jury is making careful, well thought out, fine distinctions and arriving at, at nuanced, um, uh, uh, nuanced determinations that advance our understanding. So I, I feel that we're totally capable of making these, of discussing and uh, arriving at decisions on the fine points. Um, uh, Deirdre, there's one more question. Um, it is, uh, Me Too was defined by an African-American woman in the mid-2000s. However, it did not become part of the national conversation until privileged white women started discussing it. Why are movements defined by white women feeling wronged? Well, um, that's a hard question to answer. Um, I think that no one could have predicted, you know, neither Megan Tuohy nor Jody Cantor um, nor Ronan Farrow could have predicted or did predict that their journalism would touch off the Me Too movement in this latest incarnation. It was started by Tarana Burke and it was named the Me Too movement at that time, but it didn't become part of a media storm uh, until the New York Times and the New Yorker covered it and they covered it about privileged white women, mainly actresses. Uh, and this uh, Hollywood producer. I don't know, you know, um, the main audience for the news is still white people. Um, when it became something that, uh, that affected people like Gwyneth Paltrow, um, you know, we live in a celebrity culture, uh, movie stars are our royalty, and um, people just simply paid attention. But a good thing was that those very celebrities, you know, have taken some measures to try to turn the attention back from their own celebrity to um, the trials of, of ordinary women. And um, Anita Hill is the chair of the Time's Up Commission that was founded with Hollywood money. Um, so there, there's been there's been an effort uh, and an effort on the part of also of uh, of journalism too to continue to report on how widespread these abuses are not just, not just and not primarily against celebrities. And that's the best I can do to answer that vexing question. Well, I, I like the fact that you have mentioned the two frontline um, investigative reporting documentaries, Rape on the Night Shift and Rape in the Fields. I think, um, I think that's, those are both two very important pieces. Okay, I think we're at the end. Um, again, thanks so very much to everybody who participated and especially dear to thank you to you. And thanks for historical perspective you've given us. Thank you very much for inviting me.